Hello and welcome to Bourbon and Breaches, where we cover one of our favorite bourbons and then we talk about the most interesting data breaches of the last week. Uh, you've got the Hack Notice team here. I'm Steve. I am Shu. I am Miguel. I'm Nikki. Great. And to kick things off, let's start with the bourbon. So today, we are going to be reviewing Michter's bourbon. Uh, Shu, you have you have Michter's as well. I have a bottle of Michter's right here. We will yes. be reviewing Michter's bourbon. Um, I've got their website queued up, but Shu, uh, what do you think of Michter's? Uh, Michter's is one of my more favorite ryes, so. Um, it was easy to decide to, hey, let's try the bourbon. And it is a very, very good bourbon. Um, it's not as smooth as some of the really upper end bourbons like uh, Blanton's or anything, anything, but it's got just kind of the right amount of burn and it's sweet like a bourbon, but also got a tiny bit of spiciness to it too. Yes, uh, I also have their rye, but uh, unfortunately, rye and breeches doesn't make any sense. So we're going to stick with their bourbon. Um, so Michter's got their website up here. Uh, they are a Kentucky bourbon. Um, they it's bottled and bond, so they are doing the whole process. They're not outsourcing any of it. Um, is that your understanding, Shu? That is my understanding, yes. Um, yes. And um, they are known for hand-selected charred white oak barrels, which actually, if you watch their website long enough, you'll see them charring said barrels. Um, I first got to know Michter's through their whiskey. Um, so uh, let me pull up, yeah, this one. Um, this is probably my favorite whiskey. If you can find the Michter's American whiskey, highly recommend that. Uh, but today we're doing the bourbon over here. Also, Shu and I also have the straight rye. Maybe we'll bend the rules one day and do the straight rye instead. Um, yes, sir. But uh, pure Kentucky bourbon. And um, they, so funny enough, they did some really aggressive product placement in billions does anyone watch billions i do so all of last season if you look for it and sometimes it's extremely obvious there's a bottle of mictors in at least every episode <laughs> and there is an entire episode like they they had 10 minutes of an entire scene of them just tasting the mictors i think it was the mictors uh tenure um so uh, they, they were, it was very Michter's focus. So uh, I assume that was a really good product placement for them and they paid a pretty penny. If not, kudos to them for getting some free advertisement on, uh, on Billions. Um, I, I didn't know they existed until a few years ago, but now they're everywhere. So uh, kudos to them. Um, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's do a pour and not drown the MacBook. So it's a beautiful amber color. Um, not really a red amber, more of a brownish amber. Um, what are you getting on the nose shoe? <laughs> I'm getting spices. Are you getting a little bit of a uh, cat hair on the nose? <laughs> yeah, I am. I am. Yeah. Kitten. Do you sip out of a shot glass, Shoe? I do sip out of a shot glass, yes. Yes. And that's for practical reasons, because um, I have a lot of clutter on my desk, as you can see from my office, too. Um, I don't like to keep a glass here a regular whiskey glass because I might break it. So little shot glasses are a little more durable in case I like knock it flinging around. Makes sense. So I'm getting a little bit of uh, spice on the nose, some, some alcohol heat, um, just generally smells 
uh, mild and sweet. Um, and then the flavor, I get this really smooth, it's not caramel, but it's a really smooth, like almost burnt sugar. Mm -hmm. And then um, <clears throat> just like a really pleasant uh, sweet corn finish. So I can get a little bit of corn in there. It's more distinct if I've had their rye and then I have the bourbon. You can definitely taste the difference and you get more of that corn profile. Um, but uh, now, and this is not my first uh, bourbon of the day, uh, now it just tastes like a beautiful, <laughs> sweet, like long finish too. It's just like a lasting sweetness. Um, I will sometimes do uh, a Michter's instead of like something sweet after dinner. Um, it's just uh, a very pleasant experience. Yeah, I definitely agree that there is a sweetness to it. There is, a, I, I'd go ahead and call it a caramelly flavor to it. Um, but um, there's no mistaking that it is a bourbon. It just feels like a bourbon and something else. And that, that little je, je ne sais quoi is, uh, is what makes it the special bourbon. It, it is a special bourbon. Um, and if I remember right, um, the, I think it's all to do with their barrels. And what I loved about their American whiskey is they would take those barrels and they would use them and then they'd save them and then they would age the bourbon again. And that's their American whiskey is they would um, reuse used barrels and you just get more complexity. Um, so I, you know, kudos to them for however they're, they're getting that really nice flavor. Uh, I also found uh, Michter's is a generally reliable, not budget, but good value buy. I don't know what it's like for you, Shu, but this was under $50 in central Austin, where under $50 for a very smooth, drinkable um, bourbon is hard to get. Yeah, this is definitely, um, I can't remember the exact price. I want to say it was the low 40s here, which is uh, surprising because I'm in the North Seattle suburbs and we have the highest alcohol tax in the country. So um, yeah, it is definitely, uh, you're not going to have to pay $80 for this bottle of bourbon. Yeah, um, we may feature some eighty-dollar bottles eventually. That's 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 above my comfort price range, <laughs> um, especially if we try to justify this as a work expense. But uh, um, so, deduct uh, <laughs> just deduct it. <laughs> Save your receipts, guys. Technically, I don't know. Is this a work expense? Is this a work event? I don't know. Uh, I, I would say that it. It. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it says a lot of people that want to expense bourbon now. I would say that we're here, <laughs> we're here because you told us to be here, Steve. <laughs> this yeah. was voluntary. I, no one's here against their will. Drinking bourbon at 4 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was an optional drinking bourbon at 4 p.m. Uh, besides, uh, we don't have HR, so that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Miguel, Nikki, what are you drinking? I'm a little on the soft side today, so I had I just had a coffee, an Italian coffee, so there will be no alcohol for me today. Just the breeches. Oh, yeah. I'm going the opposite. Zero coffee today. Uh, I just went with Bullet, Bullet Bourbon, um, Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, very spicy. Um, the second one is easier than the first one, and um, <laughs> and now here we are. But <laughs> bullets a good, reliable bourbon. If I'm if I'm at a bar and I don't see makers and I don't see something interesting, there's always bullet. I'll just get a bullet. Yeah, I yep. found it at the liquor store. I was I was perusing for today's episode and i found this one it was really i think it was 36 dollars for a liter which is great on a college budget i'm not in college anymore but 
you know. You're not in college <laughs> anymore. <can. laughs> Wait, they um, sell it in liters? It should be 750 milliliters or 1.5 liters. So one liter. One Just liter. one liter. That is that, yeah. head, head for scale. That is distinct. That, that sounds There are some right. are liters. I mean, I... I used to drink one that it's called Glenmorangie Glen or Glenmorangie. I don't know the pronunciation mm -hmm. on that one. That's one liter. JB has a one liter bottle as well. All right, Nikki, what do we got this week? Ready for breaches? All right, let's uh, let's kick it off. Number one breach. We're gonna start with a headline from Threat Post, and that will be about a breach uh, with Home Depot. I think it's just Canadian Home Depots, if that makes sense. Home Depot basically had sent up to 500 customers details about other customers' details. Like other customers had bought stuff online and these people got the updates. And people were freaking out and took to Twitter to basically out some poor social media manager. And they had to figure this out that they had done some internal error and let all this information out. Um, you know, when they had basically found out that it wasn't uh, any external actors and it was all done by mistake in house, uh, it only brought up the fact that they had a huge breach in 2014 where 50 million credit card numbers were stolen, 53 million email addresses were pilfered and at Home Depot, ended up paying $19.5 million to the victims of that prior incident. So, you know, when a large company gets hit like this, it's kind of, and it wasn't an external actor, what can you do then, you know? Yeah, I mean, Home Depot had a, had a large breach in the past, and that was bad. Um, and like you said, credit cards impacted millions of people. Um, this seems more like data mismanagement, almost, almost like a, a rogue email script was running in their environment. So it's not good. Um, they definitely shouldn't be sharing those details and those details can be damaging. But in the grand scale of things, it's a pretty minor breach. What do you guys think? I agree with you. Um, and as a, uh, with my background in software development, um, it's, uh, it's hard to call this, I, I guess maybe technically it is breach, but uh, the root cause of this is that uh, some developer or some administrator messed up somewhere and misconfigured something. It's sort of like the equivalent of sending out a mass email and instead of BCCing everyone, you put everyone on a CC, on a CC list. So um, in the grand scheme of things, right, it's not that big of a deal, but, but it just goes to show that all aspects of your company, including the development team and the DevOps team, and the sysadmins, they need to consider security first in their practices. I, I agree. I, I would argue, I would argue that putting everyone on the two instead of the BCC or even on the CC, that's not a breach. That's dumb, but it happens all the time. And all you're doing is exposing emails or email addresses, um, it's data mismanagement, but it's, I, I wouldn't qualify it as anything close to a breach. And I don't think legally it would be qualified as anything close to a breach. What makes this a breach is when it exposes purchase information and account information. And that, that can be used maliciously. Um, and I, uh, I think that people are more sensitive to this because of Home Depot's previous large breach, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, you know, you've had a big breach. You should be super sensitive to this. Uh, I, I think it is important that um, 
you'll see a lot of breaches that have happened due to effectively bad code, right? Engineers that are not coding security first. Um, and you, you know, you saw it with Facebook a lot, you saw it with Twitter a lot. Basically, they left holes in their API um, and that ended up letting data get out. Um, and so it's security is very much, I mean, software development is exploding. The number of software engineers is exploding. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I don't think that, that they're thinking security first, but if you're not thinking security first, um, your business could have a huge loss. One of the follow-ups, one of the articles I had found uh, connected to this was they were now looking out for where the, 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 these data you know, packages are, are being found or where they could end up because one scenario is somebody gets it and they live in that city and they can go and pose as a delivery person or something like that and just basically a lot of rabbit hole situations that are very scary to think about but were not really you know explained thoroughly in terms of oh an address was was leaked or somebody's personal information well you could probably find it on facebook but in reality if somebody really had you know real intent to do something with it, they could because they have the starting information to kind of, you know, plan everything out ahead of time. So they're looking out to see if these uh, data points will be um, found again. Well, the, the most important data point is the order number and what they ordered. And <clears throat> there's a bunch of social engineering attacks you can do with that. There is an old social, social engineering attack um, that uh, you could basically call up a pizza delivery place say hey I just called um, but I think I gave you the wrong name um, you know can you read back to me uh, the name on that last order oh it's Fred right yeah no I'm Fred oh did you get my order no my order is fine okay I'll, I'll go and get it and so like you can social engineer your way to like a free pizza right um, if, if you if you work hard enough, but with Home Depot, you know, you've got the order number, you've got what was bought. You can just show up to customer support and be like, Hey, uh, I'm here for my order. You know, here's the number, here's what I bought, you know, here's my name, uh, give it to me. And, uh, I think customer support would, would, unless they're really security conscious, which they probably aren't, uh, would just give it to you. Very much so, especially right now with uh, curbside pickup so common these days. Yeah, COVID makes it so much worse because it's like you're literally wearing a mask. Like, okay, you can't see this and I've got sunglasses on. It's like, yeah, I'm Fred. Uh, give me my stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've gone in to pick up stuff for my wife uh, and they asked me, uh, what's her name? And that's it. <laughs> and they're like, here you go. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. You ever got it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Nope. <laughs> Moving on to number two. So the number two data breach is coming out of Forbes. The headline reads, ransomware gang claims international casino equipment supplier as latest victim. And uh, we, we talked about it recently. Russians, man, they're really good at this. Uh, the hacking group known as Revel? Revel? Re, one of those. Re Evil. Re Evil. Well, that's, Ooh, that's good. Spell that there, one wrong. There you go. Um, they basically <coughs> had broken into a supplier of uh, gaming equipment for casinos all around the world. Uh, they had demanded, uh, I forget how much it was. They demanded a lot and gave them a 72 hour uh, it was response millions, time. Right? It was millions, but I have millions and a lot of these breaches to where I don't want to get it wrong. So I was like, mm, well, uh, so they basically gave a, a lot of time to, for them to respond because they said that they had infiltrated every system that they had, every computer, every server, and that's a huge threat given that these guys are very good at what they do and it is reported that they have made more than a hundred million dollars in their first year of operation. And what's funny about this, well, not funny. It kind of is. 
they're so as a company, as a group, as a gang, they're okay. gearing up to break a billion. A billion dollars. And how? Like a regular company, by recruiting talent and working with other hacking groups. So they're just looking to expand. They're looking to hire, if you guys are looking. <laughs> hey, that's a lot of money. That's good revenue. Looking to bring a billion dollars. What do you guys think? So I love everything about this. In fact, <laughs> uh, just make a TV series and I'll watch it. I, I love, it's a ransomware gang trying to become a billion dollar company. Um, they're recruiting. Uh, so we, we, we uh, monitor re-evil uh, at Hack Notice. Uh, we see all of the disclosures that, that they publish uh, and they publish a lot. Um, and uh, there's, there's this weird thing where uh, there's a shortage of hackers and these gangs have started to recruit aggressively and like trying to recruit hackers because they have so many ransoms that they're able to pull off that they need more hackers to handle it. And I love the mix of old world, allegedly mob or mafia, um, casinos and very much new world like hacker gangs um just like just set me up do do a crossover sopranos versus uh mr robot and I'll, i'm in <laughs> yeah i've watched that too but uh nothing wrong to being to looking forward to entering the next century so good for them <laughs> yeah what's really interesting is that as they are identified by a gang they probably don't do it themselves but you know how there's the idea that traditional gangs you have to get beaten up and initiated and all that when you can do it from home and it's all just kind of chatting back and forth it's kind of like a friendly environment isn't it it's kind of like well they think i'm really good at stealing a bunch of data and they want me on their team like i can see this as being a buddy buddy movie you know i times are changing I would ask Miguel, but from my experience, um, and people look at me weird whenever I say this, uh, the hacker community is one of the most inclusive, friendly, <laughs> supportive communities I've ever been a part of. And maybe I just know a lot of bad people um, that are not inclusive and supportive. But like, you go into a hacker forum, and you're like, hey, I'm trying to learn how to hack. Can anyone help me? And like, they will bend over backwards, be like, oh, there's all these resources. So you, you know, here's how you commit credit card fraud. Let me know if you need any help. <laughs> like, they, they will teach you how to commit crimes and like commit them well. And, and I'm just always amazed. Like, I've seen hackers say, hey, I'm really looking for information about Bob Smith. He works at, at Acme Inc. And you'll see replies immediately like, oh, I know Bob. Yeah, here's all of his information. Here's his social. Here's his kid's name. You know, good luck. It is exactly like that. I mean, I don't know if it is the sense of community or belonging or the fact that maybe they feel better with much more people committing the crime, many more people committing the crime. Maybe that's a sense of, hey, if everybody's doing it, it's not that bad. I don't know the exact reason, but it, it's exactly like you described. They are very, very helpful and welcoming. So this is actually a great environment that promotes teamwork. This is better than what we've been experiencing for the past 24 hours in terms of like election day and all that. It's like, <laughs> you guys are working better than the US government. And that, that's the scary thing. That's the thing that I always say is companies share far less intelligence than hackers do. Think about that. Bank of America and Wells Fargo have thousands of security professionals on staff. And I guarantee they, they don't share very much information at all. Hackers will share everything. Like hackers will, sh will build tools they're using to hack and then just share it. Give it away. Right? Yeah, just give it away. And then, and then they'll work on config files together. They'll work on like new, I've seen hackers working on new phishing emails collaboratively like hey i'm working on these five new phishing emails what do you like guys you think just google doc and yeah 
<laughs> you can let me know what you think. Yeah, I mean, it's not Google, it's, it's Yandex, but it's the oh. Yandex cloud. I mean, it's the Russian Google, but yeah. <laughs> Crazy. That puts companies at a substantial disadvantage. Mm -hmm. If your attackers are coordinating and you can't coordinate amongst your defenders. Yep. Yikes. Yep. Um, last, last point on this is I am incredibly interested to see if they got access to source code because we've seen in the past, whenever you get access to slot machine source code, people always find these really weird hacks where they can game the system and guarantee a big payout. And so that's the big, that's the big risk here is you've got the source code of live slot machines. You can walk into any casino in Vegas and you can basically win. Um, so I don't know if they disclose that. Uh, and, and ReEvil does publish, as far as I know, um, uh, ransomware data. So that would be a, a huge problem for uh, this company is if ReEvil publishes a uh, gaming machine source code, because then it's just a matter of finding a bug and you can have it unlimited money. So that's a good point. I don't see on this article whether they paid. This article was published October 31st. Saturday. Uh, we don't know Halloween. when this happened. And they were given 72 hours. So they either had to have paid or not paid by now. Yeah, I looked um, up uh, any updates today and there was nothing. It was basically all just posting the same story. So maybe I would assume, I would assume that they're probably in communication if nothing else has come out of it. Or, right. you know, it's a Mexican standoff. Yeah, yeah. So a uh, question to you guys, uh, Miguel and Steve, um, do you know if ReEvil, if someone doesn't pay, do they just release the data or they try to blackmail and, uh, and, and sell the data uh, in an option? Um, I don't remember their exact disclosure policy. So each ransomware gang has a disclosure policy. <laughs> so they, they have rules of engagement. Come on, they're professionals. Right. And uh, some will threaten. So some, if you don't immediately pay, they disclose your name. And they say, hey, <clears throat> uh, our friends over at Acme Inc. are not uh, paying. Um, and it's basically a warning. And then if they don't pay within the next week or so, they'll just, they will uh, release 5% of the data. And then they'll release 15 and then 50 and then all of it. Um, and they do each one with a warning. So um, for us to know about it, I don't recall if, if the company disclosed it or ReEvil disclosed it. For us to know about it, that means that they are at least not paying on time. Um, and it's a warning. Uh, and sometimes warnings come with some data to prove it. Uh, but uh, almost everyone has a progression. And so if they don't pay within the next 30, 60, 90 days, all 500 gigs will be available. That's bad. But the thing was with blackmail, either it's cyber or traditional blackmail is how do you know for sure that you pay and you're going to get off the hook? I mean, that that information will not be eventually be released anyway, anyhow. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing about ransomware is ransomware has standardized to where if you pay 97% uh, of the time, if you pay, they uh, give you the decryption key to decrypt your data and they don't release your data. So they, ransomware only works if you pay the ransom if nothing bad happens to you. That's, that's the motivation. What they have found though, is as soon as you pay, you go on a short list and a few months later, they target you heavily. Oh, they will they, hit you again. They will try they to hit you again. They know you pay. So it's like, hey, nice company you have. It'd be a shame if something bad happened to it. And then they bust it up a little bit and you pay. And then they come back, you know, because ransomware doesn't, doesn't get a monthly fee. You can't tax them. So they come <coughs> back a few months later and they try it again. Well, by that point, I would apply the fool me once mm -hmm. concept. Then, I mean, can happen once, it can happen to anybody. If it happens twice, then shame on you. I mean, you should have better security by then. We, we have a saying in Texas, 
Fool, fool me once, shame on, shame on you. <laughs> fool me, don't get fooled again. <laughs> I remember. I wonder if they. So let's say, uh, I wonder if they offer operate like a traditional mafia. If you get hit once, then maybe you could hire them for protection, right? Give them like a monthly fee to monitor your network. There you go, man. Ransom as a service. Um, Ransom as a service. And software as a service because reliable revenue is better than per event revenue, even for criminals. I don't think anyone's trying it. Shu, you may have just created a new criminal uh, enterprise. So I I may have uh, hook us up with uh, hook up me up you. with our yeah yeah hook me up with our, our CFO and maybe we can uh, launch that. <laughs> <laughs> we need a good accountant on this. All right. Okay. Here we go. Number three. Number three is going to be out of um, info security. And it covers a public transit system getting hacked. The um, Canadian Transit Societe de Montreal got hit with a phishing email and hackers gained access to their entire network and demanded $2.8 million from this public service um, to which Societe de Montreal just basically said, no, <laughs> uh, we're not going to pay that. They just didn't. And a week later, uh, they haven't figured out who the hacker was, but a different organization was hacked and it was the health agency in West Montreal. So they basically just think they just duck clear of the woods and they're fine. But, um, you know, when it's a public agency like this, uh, what do you guys think? Is there, are there lines for hackers in terms of like what they hack or do they just, is there anything that they can? No, there, there's no lines. Um, but $2.8 million from a, train transit so system? that that you're right uh they overpriced it you know ransomware is an art not a science you have to figure <laughs> out how much can you extort from someone <laughs> um plus i do have to say being hit with ransomware and just saying no that's the most french thing i've heard all day <laughs> like that's that the, the French are, are notorious for, for just saying no. Like no is their default answer. And I, I can see that conversation. <laughs> they, they, got, they got the heads of um, the, the Montreal train service in a room and they said, oh, these ransomware, uh, this ransomware gang, they, they want $2.8 million. And they go, no. Nah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So kudos for them for saying no. It's pretty pretty ballsy to say, hey, uh, we don't need to pay. Screw you guys. And it sounds like in the article, they got 77% of their operations back. Um, I'm wondering if it was just uh, good IT practices that they were able to recover so quickly. Um, and it doesn't sound like any personal customer data here was was breached and if it was I, I wonder if they would be more willing to pay yeah um it sounded like it was all infrastructure systems it's operational stuff yeah which is good and then uh ransomware only works be because people don't back up and one one of the posts that i have coming up um about ransomware um, the entire focus is on backup policies and backup systems. If, if you back up every day, ran, ransomware does not work because you can just wipe the machine and restore from backup. So uh, ransomware is really a data management problem. And uh, clearly it's working and clearly no one does data management properly. Um, but if you had a proper continuous backup or even daily backup, um, there's no reason to pay the ransom. Just, just wipe the system. Well, first figure out how they got in 
then wipe the system, restore from backup, and you're you're back back to business. What's the highest uh, amount that has been granted in a situation like this from like a like a public system like you know a transit train? Didn't wasn't it Baltimore? Baltimore paid some ungodly amount. I think the city of Durham paid over twenty million. And then Baltimore played, paid like fifty million, or or they wow. were ex- extorted for fifty million. That is a lot of money. Like, where does this money sit? Where does it go? The sit the city just has it. <laughs> this is a good question that I've been. I look at these stories all the time, and I'm like, okay, cool. Large numbers just moving around everywhere. I have a bank account. How does it like? <laughs> I, where do, if I were a hacker and I was wanting to extort this, you know, $5 million or whatever, where would I put it? How do you get away with it? Oh, where does it for, sit for the hacker? Oh, that, yeah. that's easy. That, that's super easy. You, uh, Bitcoin. It's, it's, it's all on Bitcoin. Say so it's either Bitcoin or Cayman Islands. Yeah, I don't think, no. I think it's all Bitcoin. Like, I would some ungodly statistic it's all bitcoin now now if they're smart they are diversifying their coins and they're probably using monero monero is the currency of hackers monero if you're a hacker this is like the john wick coin (laughs) yes that monero is the gold of hackers um and uh and so Monero is Bitcoin, but anonymous, and uh, you can't trace amounts and unless you own the majority of the network, uh, you can't figure out who's doing what. So Monero is really the coin of preference for hackers, but um, Bitcoin is the coin of preference for hackers storing their money. Um, I was watching Vice, and they did uh, a episode on sim swapping and sim swapping is incredibly lucrative you take someone's you take over someone's phone and you can drain their bank account and uh they're interviewing a sim swapper um that had uh stolen 40 to 90 million and it was all in bitcoin uh they say some some ungodly amount like 90 percent of the bitcoin chain never changes hands um wow so it's a storage of value. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's all in crypto. Um, I, I think it sits in crypto and then they pull like small amounts out very carefully whenever they want to spend it. Um, and there's, there's even companies where you, where you don't have to do that. You can take out a loan versus your crypto. If you prove you, you own it, you can take out a loan versus your crypto, use it as collateral. You can spend all of that and then you can, you know, do a small amount to pay off the interest. So I could like uh, put up some ransomware, get some Bitcoin and then uh, go do my weekly grocery shopping with it. But wasn't the official policy to not negotiate with terrorists? Well, that's a good point. Uh, Didn't the FBI just like send some nasty gram to all companies saying like, Hey, stop paying ransoms. It was a blanketed statement that was essentially, they were exploring the idea of imposing fines to companies that paid ransoms when they got held up. I mean, talk about salt in the wound. Like (laughs) if, if, if you don't have a backup, you pay the ransom. Otherwise, you don't exist. So the FBI can either find companies that got hacked or, you know, effectively be responsible for a lot of companies going under because right. they don't pay the ransom. So, yeah, I mean, like, that's very much victim blaming. I, I get it. You don't, you, like, some of these payments are going to North, North Korea, and that's, you know, that's, not okay but um what alternative do you have i I think that's the key like uh you if you don't want me to pay a ransom give me an alternative fix it (laughs) 
yeah i think it, it, it i i think it goes to um like like the faa has a policy uh federal aviation administration where um they they really want to um uh, their main concern is is for problems not to occur again so if you so generally the faa is if, if you screw up as a pilot uh they really want to minimize or eliminate victim shaming they want to find out what what went wrong and uh like uh, apparently from what i understand like, the first several fines are really minimal um and they just want you to learn your lesson and it seems like the fbi is kind of doing a different tact here where um they do want to punish you and i think that is that is a that is a problem all right nikki all what, right here what, we go. what horrible dystopian news do you have for us today <laughs> uh so funny enough this is actually the the bright spot let me share my screen and uh number four actually comes to us by way of zdnet and the headline reads Hacker steals 24 million from cryptocurrency service Harvest Finance. But here's the thing, he pays back 2.5 mil. And top line notes are basically $24 million stolen. Yes, that's a huge deal. Um, but they're wondering why did he return $2.5 million almost two minutes after? Uh, the company Harvest Finance had basically released a statement that said, find who this hacker is and we'll give you $100,000. Um, and then they said, we have some information and we think we know who it is, but don't put out their information if you think that you know who they are. So they're kind of like stopping people in the community from taking action, I guess, or trying to position themselves as knowing who it is and willing to, you know, be like, just, it's not a big deal if you give us the money back. And, you know, anybody else who's watching outside of this, do not dox this person because that's a messed up thing to do. So it's kind of a funny situation. Either way, t over $20 million has been stolen. Um, back to the cryptocurrency scheme and, and how it works. What is this guy doing? What do you think happened here? <laughs> I, I have some theories and none of them are sane. Um, these are all fa far out there. One theory is um, somehow they had some sort of traceable coin and 2.4 million of it was traceable. So, so they, they said they had uh, USD coin and then they had Tether, right? Those are both um, yep. tethered to fiat. Um, and then, but they didn't say exactly what the 2.4 million was in. So there's the crime and then there's getting away with the crime. And if it's like those marked dollar bills at a bank, right? you don't want to take the marked ones or the ones with like the ink packet in it. So my theory is somehow they had some traceable coin or one of the accounts was being held by Disney and Mickey Mouse threatened him and he just returned that shit. <laughs> Not messing with Disney. No, no. Yeah, no. I think anyone that's ever dealt with Disney would say you don't fuck with Disney. Well, that was the big question. Like in all the other articles that were attached to it was, you know, the Harvest Finance had put out a hundred thousand dollar bounty, and then they raised it to four hundred thousand after saying that they had information on a lead, and then they were like, "Well, we have a lead, but if you have a lead, don't put out any personal information." I guess that's a good thing for a company to do because then you have people that are just gonna, you know, Salem witch trial people who yeah. they think. But then they, they reduced it back. They said, "You know, it's four hundred thousand." And then we'll scale it back to the original 100,000 after, you know, 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, which is kind of if, an odd strategy. If I had 20 million stolen, I would be far less concerned about doxing um, the perpetrator. 20 
Well, technically 22 million after the exchange and exchange back. After the return. Yeah. I question the governance council of whatever company this is. <laughs> Harvest but, Finance. But um, crypto's a weird, shady world. And I assume this is only part of the story. And I assume the real story is going to make for a great made for TV movie. Yeah, Ocean this 32. is why. This is why I don't um, invest all my life savings in Bitcoin. I mean, not only the volatility issue, but uh, we've had several major Bitcoin cryptocurrency exchanges get hacked and just absolutely destroyed within uh, since their creation. So you could easily lose all your money just in a flash. So Mount Gox is the thing that comes off, uh, comes out of the top of my head here. This is just another example of the dangers of trading cryptocurrency. So I do a lot with crypto. Um, and I have lost, I have lost value in crypto because I bought and then the crypto went down. Um, I've also gained value in crypto. Um, I've, I've lost more than I've gained, but I, I use crypto as a utility. I use it to pay for shit. And um, you don't leave currency in an exchange. Like rule number one, don't leave currency in an exchange. You put it in a wallet and you make sure that that wallet is secure. Um, so if like, and whenever I buy crypto, as soon as usually like Coinbase or whatever, as soon as they let me move it, I move it. Like just don't trust the internet with your finances at all. Um, so crypto is fun and interesting and exciting but also completely unregulated. And a lot of the pump and dump schemes that happened early on in the stock market happen every day. So you have to realize what, what you're getting into. But if you get past all that, like you, <laughs> crypto, can, crypto can be great. I uh, needed some more coins and I bought some coins and they're up 40%. And I was like, that's great. Nothing's up 40% this year. Um, yeah, but it's but it's crypto. So, so it's it's exactly like putting taking out your wallet from your back pocket, putting it down on a roulette table, and just letting it ride indefinitely. Eh, the, the the crypto has intrinsic value, um, or it has social value, and you can reliably hold crypto, um, and. Crypto has utility. That's what, that's what I use it for. That's what we use it for, is utility. Crypto does things that other currencies can't. Um, and that's cool. Um, but it is, uh, there's, there's probably a thousand coins out there. And some of them are scams. Like some of them are very much pump and dump scams. So you, you very much have to, have to be wary. It's, it's more like, it's more like the stock market in the 1920s um, or playing penny stocks. Like, you know, you don't, you don't really know what you're getting unless you're smart. I will keep my wallet then. Okay. We ready for number five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number five, let me share my screen. Number five is also coming by way of ZDNet and this one is a, little, is a bit more fun um, if you're not involved. <laughs> I made a breach. <laughs> uh, it's coming from GDNet. Configuration snafu exposes passwords for 2 million marijuana growers. Um, Grow Diaries is a online community for marijuana <coughs> growers. They had a slight security hiccup that had released the records of usernames, emails, IP addresses, account passwords for 1.4 million users. Um, and nothing has really come of this. 
simply because there's not really information. It's just like the breach from before where we were talking about, it's not really hard information, but it is, you know, usernames, emails, IP addresses, passwords, and, and grow dryer, grow diaries, just basically advise all their users, change your passwords should be enough. Uh, we don't, you know, store your credit card information. You're only here to share seed stories about your, your marijuana crop. Um, lighthearted ending for the roundup this week, but what do you guys think? Grow diaries. Uh, <laughs> Grow diaries. diaries. I, I think we need a rule that whenever you slur a name, you have to take yeah. a shot. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard. Grow diaries. Right it just snowballs from there. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're doing anything even borderline illegal, don't share it on the internet. Is kind of the, the, this is a large community. It, it is but a large 1. community. 1.4 million. I was incredibly surprised to hear they had 1.4 million. Good on them. Good on them getting 1.4 million users. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a lot of um, opinions about this, but let's, let's hear from Shu first. Yeah. Uh, so that's my first takeaway. Um, and second of all, um, don't use MD5. Like it's 2020. At this point, everyone knows what's uh, a insecure and unsecure algorithm. Uh, MD5 is definitely unsecure. Don't use MD5. No. End well, of story. That's it's, all I have to ask. It's even, it's even worse than that. So, okay. There's a lot of nuance in this story. The first is they were storing user records and user hashed passwords inside of Elasticsearch. I think even Elasticsearch would say, don't store user data. <laughs> we're a search yeah. index. What are you doing? Like, there's free account management software out there from like semi reputable companies like Google. Like why not just use Google or why not use Firebase or, or why not just write it all down in a notebook? Like don't put it into a search index. The, the sheer, the whole premise of a search index is you want it to be searched by multiple people. Like that's the exact opposite of what you want people's passwords. And, and so technically it's not hackers breaking into grow diaries. It's the security researcher that found an open Kibana, uh, which is the UI on top of uh, Elasticsearch. So that this, this search uh, that this researcher has, has done this before. Um, good on him for finding it. Um, but I blame Elasticsearch. And the reason is uh, we use Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch in their base model, in their community free model, they have no security. You have to pay for security. You have to pay for, um, I don't even remember what it's called. There's an X in the name, Security X or Search X or something. I don't know. Uh, we, we obviously don't pay for it. But security is not a feature. Security is required. And if you've built a database where roles and permissions and passwords are not included by default, like shame on you. This, is, this will continue to keep happening with, with Elasticsearch because security is not built in. It is turned into an, an upgrade. Uh, and it's, it's asinine. If I charged my users an extra dollar for multi-factor authentication, like I would get hate mail, right? Because it's like, why are you charging me to be more secure? You should want me to be more secure. So we, we use SearchGuard. SearchGuard has a community edition. Uh, it's hard to set up, but it's a free way to add security to Elasticsearch, but it's hard enough that probably the majority of Elasticsearch developers out there would have trouble setting it up. Um, so I blame um, Grow Diaries. Is it Grow Diaries? Grow Diaries. Grow, Grow Diaries. Diaries. Um, don't put user information in a search index. And I blame Elasticsearch. Don't make security 
a paid feature. Um, and then I blame the users. Look, hack notice tip of the day, lie, just lie, lie on the internet. Like it's not illegal and no one will know. Just make up a name and an address. Use your enemy's address. <laughs> like just lie on the internet. Don't, don't give your actual name and address of where you're illegally or maybe illegally growing marijuana. Even if it's legal, it's a valuable commodity. You don't want to tell everyone, hey, I've got like $20,000 worth of weed in my house. Like just lie, <laughs> lie on the internet and this won't be a problem. <laughs> I'm done. That is great, yeah. <laughs> I agree, I agree 100%, especially with the last bit. I mean, you don't have to provide your, your real information when you're doing things borderline illegal. I mean, that's, that's lacking seriously the, se the sense of self-preservation. Yeah, I didn't do, I didn't like look into the site or look at these profiles and I am now. It's kind of interesting. I guess it's just, it's just people will post some pictures of their, their plants and the progressions they're going in and fascinating. <laughs> what a, what an odd. So yeah. <laughs> it's your growth diary. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. But no, the, the, your 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 point though, Steve, it's like the uh, um, yeah, they, it, it's definitely a, a misuse of Elasticsearch, right? They should not be using uh, storing username and passwords in there. That's 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 kind of crazy. But even if they were doing it in a traditional database, um, that's not a great idea. There's standards out there now like uh, access delegation and author authorization standards like OAuth and uh, OpenID, where uh, you say you, uh, it's actually available on, on Grow Diaries. You can log in with Twitter, your Twitter account, log in with your Facebook, and you let some other big company handle that stuff, right? You let some other, other company handle the credentials and you are not responsible for holding someone's password. So how do you know OAuth is available on Grow Diaries? Just curious. <laughs> <laughs> um, got a friend that maybe have a profile there. <laughs> that, that was an intimate detail that I did not expect. Um, the no, problem no, with- I'm clicking on sign up here. It says log in with Facebook, log in with Twitter. Those are standard, standard things. Go. Twitter, so Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, they all have these services. It's a good idea to use them. I, I agree. Except those services try to make you not lie about who you are. And mm -hmm. lying is very important on the internet. The problem with everyone switching to OAuth and everyone authenticating through Google is Google tries very hard to figure out who you are and they try to prevent you from lying. Yes. Um, and even if you can give Google a fake name and address, which you can, they want to know your phone number. And it's incredibly right. hard these days to make a burner phone number. You can do it, there's ways, but it's incredibly hard. The average person cannot successfully lie to Google about who they are. Um, and so uh, I fully support using your own authentication service, but, but if you don't wanna build it, use Firebase or use any of the hundred off the shelf authentication services and then just, Use, use standards, use Bcrypt. Like you don't have to use MD5, which was like popular 15 years ago. Um, and then put it into anything other than a search index, please. Can you lie on Twitter? Does Twitter require a phone? No, Twitter requires a phone number, don't they? Yeah, I think that's the major problem with all these services now is that they require cell phone numbers. Yeah, and, and uh, it's really nefarious 
if you get a burner SIM, theoretically, <laughs> um, you have to give them an email address. But almost every email address provider requires a phone number. Mm. So you have to find an email address provider that does not require a phone number in order to even start your SIM, which gives you a burner number, which you can then use to sign up for other stuff. Uh, that should be easy enough with all those disposable email accounts. Yeah. But it, it, it's clear, Google, Facebook, Twitter, they, they want to know who you are. They, they don't want to yeah. let you be anonymous. Fully agree. That, uh, which is a problem. So that entire story was messed up. Everything about Grow Diaries was messed up. This whole breach was unnecessary. Mm -hmm. but good on that researcher for finding it. Like, it's better than a hacker finding it. And who knows how many people had anonymously accessed that cabana. Hey, that's another thing. Cabana is, um, speaking of personal experience, it is very powerful. Um, and also very, very easy to misconfigure, just like Elasticsearch. So you got to know what you're doing with those before you just decide, say, hey, let's go Elasticsearch and Kibana. Yeah, you, you got to build roles into Elasticsearch. And from the roles in Elasticsearch, you can build a safe way of logging into Kibana. Um, but even then, if you want Kibana to be useful, you have to give Kibana pretty much admin level access. And so you, you can delete a whole index with one command and that's scary. There's no, are you sure? Or like multi-factor, there's no delete guard. It's like, hey, delete this index. And they're like, all right, it's gone. <laughs> all right, you know what you're doing, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I deleted a five billion record index once. I did it on purpose. Nice. <laughs> I deleted it with one command. Uh, that was scary. <laughs> uh, final thoughts? It would be kind of just taking a part from every single segment. So lie a little bit when you start an account, when you grow your weed and <laughs> transact with cryptocurrency. Stuff. Um, I'm curious as to, I think, did you rearrange your, your room, Miguel? No, I did not. <laughs> Is the drawer always open? Uh, oh, that might be the case. Yeah. <laughs> that might be the case. That's where yeah. he hides his weed. Yeah. yeah. That's, I'm going to look for Miguel's profile. Forbidden stuff. Yeah. The forbidden stuff. Good. Miguel, I'm going to look for your profile on growdiaries.com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you won't find it. I'm in Latin America. Grow, grow. <laughs> you need to look for me out there. All right. Uh, this has been an episode of Bourbon and Breaches. If you liked this episode, like, subscribe, follow, retweet. Uh, tick and talk this episode for more content. Um, and if you want to learn more about data breaches for your company, you can get all of that information at hacknotice.com. Uh, until next time. Bye, everyone. Cheers. Bye, guys. Bye. Have a good one.